Welcome back to Amazing But True, our New York Mets podcast from the New York Post. I'm your host, Jake Brown. Follow me on Twitter at Jake Brown Radio. Follow the podcast at Amazing But True. Watch us on the New York Post Sports YouTube page. Subscribe there. Give us a thumbs up below. Comment below. How are you feeling about the Mets after they won two out of three over the very, very, very lousy Pittsburgh Pirates? The guest today on the program will be longtime New York Met, lifelong New York Met, a member of the 1969 World Series champion Mets, Ed Cranepool, the author of the book, The Last Miracle, My 18-Year Journey with the Amazing New York Mets. So Eddie Cranepool has been on the show on the phone before. I don't think he's been on Zoom before, so you could look at Ed's beautiful face as he joins us. In just a few minutes, he will join me for a fun conversation on the book, the current Mets, the frustrations, when will they win again? Some good perspective from a guy who had to wait, you know, seven years, eight years to finally get one and get the first one with the Mets and who spent his entire career here. The Mets won on Wednesday afternoon by the help of DJ Stewart's two home runs, by the help of Pete Alonzo's 36 homer, and Tyler McGill winning his first game in two months. And it shows you that records mean nothing in baseball because Tyler McGill is seven and six. <laughs> And he's got a 5-5 ERA. So don't look at pitchers' records much because some get more run support than others. But a big week for DJ Stewart with the homers. His first hit off a lefty this year is a two-run homer. A big series for Jonathan Aruz, who hit a homer Monday. He hit a homer Tuesday, his first two homers as a New York Met. Not a good series for Grant Hartwig, who had just a miserable seventh inning with a walk to make it 2-1 with the base loader, hit by pitch to make it 3-1, a pass ball to make it 4-1, a double to make it 6-1, a triple to make it 7-1. Uh, the Pirates are really terrible. Uh, this is a team who started off really good, and you can't look too much, folks, into April records because their turnaround has been bad, and they have a lot of pitchers you may never see again or have never heard of. And the Mets have been shuffling guys up and down, up and down. I don't know who's on the Mets roster anymore. Every day there's a new guy on the team, and, you know, you're hoping you're coming days away from potentially seeing Ronnie Mauricio. The hope is that the 19th, when, you know, the contract and everything is, you know, settled where the Mets get the extra year control, we maybe see him in St. Louis this weekend when the Mets take on the Cardinals for four games. If not, then it's probably going to be September. If we don't see him in September, that means he's got to be getting traded this offseason because there's absolutely no reason we shouldn't be watching Ronnie Mauricio play some third base. A ruse has been okay. Ortega had a few hits Wednesday. He's been okay. But these guys aren't part of the 2024 Mets and beyond. So I hate to keep, you know, banging on the drum for Ronnie Mauricio. But if the contract thing is the is the deal breaker here, that's up in a few days. So if he's not in St. Louis, maybe he'll be in Atlanta when the Mets get demolished again, probably by the Braves next week. The Mets are eight out of the wild card. It is pretty fascinating that how bad this month has gone. They've barely lost any ground. And it really keeps making you think, man, what if they kept some of these guys together? But clearly there were clubhouse issues, and this team does not mesh in the clubhouse. These guys don't play for each other. There's a lot of egos, and you're seeing it out on the field. You're seeing it when the team celebrates. There's not the enthusiasm for the game, and these guys have checked out on the season. The New York Mets are, are ready for the offseason. They're ready to be on a beach and be off the baseball field. This team doesn't care that much. And you're seeing some poor pitching, some poor command, a lot of walks. There were double-digit walks in every game this series. It was a tough watch if you were at the ballpark. And if you were there Tuesday, you were there for one reason and one reason only. That's the Edwin Diaz trumpet bobble it. There it is. Now I will do a demonstration of taps. How does taps go? I don't, I don't remember. I can't think of it off the top of my head, but um, this is the bobble it. It's pretty cool. You know, the the letters are a little faded off there. I don't know what happened in the box. This one is not one of the signed ones. I bet some people got the signed ones. I will not rip off Edwin Diaz's head. But it's a telling sign. When Tuesday is Edwin Diaz bobblehead, Trump of bobblehead, he's been out for the year, and no reason to bring him back in late September. And Wednesday afternoon was supposed to be the Max Scherzer two-tone sunglasses. And, and those are gone. So they got rid of those, and you're coming for promotions now. You're coming for Otani next weekend. That should be a good crowd for Otani. Maybe the Corduroy hat in September is a good crowd. The Friday against the Angels is the uh, Ghost Fork Ball giveaway. So, you know, you're going for your promotions and that's it. Because, you know, Tuesday night was just a terrible game. You know, I you know, I was there, but uh, wasn't really watching much of it. It was rough. 
But at this point, the Mets just looking to see what you have in the young guys. See if you got any pitchers here that'll come up and show something, show some life. But otherwise, man, this is a tough sell. It is a tough watch for the remainder of this season. And is, you know, it's sad. Um, yeah, we'll we'll play the taps audio here. <laughs> Post production will have, we'll have the taps on. <laughs> that'll be that'll be a video right there. The taps. So the trumpet bobblehead. The Mets take two out of three over the Pirates, and now they are fifty-five and sixty-six, one hundred and twenty-one games in, forty-one to go. Tom Seaver games remaining. And speaking of Tom Seaver, his teammate on the nineteen sixty-nine Mets was Ed Cranepool. Played his entire career with the Mets from sixty-two to seventy-nine. Won the Mets first championship in sixty-nine. And Ed Cranepool is going to join me next on Amazing But True. Jake Brown, Amazing But True podcast, New York Post, as we reacted to the Mets series win. Now we transition to an interview with the longest tenured Met ever. I don't think anyone's going to play 18 years with the Mets ever again. If it happens, God bless him. But this guy did it from 1962 to 1979. He's a Mets Hall of Famer, 1965 All-Star, of course. A 1969 Miracle Mets World Series champion. And speaking of Miracle, you can go get his book now. The Last Miracle, my 18-year journey with the amazing New York Mets. Let's welcome Ed Cranepool to Amazing But True. Welcome back to the show, Ed. Uh, took us a while to set it up, but you're here. You look beautiful. Welcome to the program. How are you doing? Well, that was the biggest miracle, I guess, getting on the program. But it's a pleasure being here. Yeah, that part didn't make it to the book. But maybe that'll make the uh, the extended version of the, the book, the second copy, the second copy. We'll yeah, it'll make it'll make the Kindle version, the digital <laughs> copy of the book. How to get on a Zoom? We figured it out, and we're glad to have you on. And uh, what inspired you to write the book? Obviously, you had a long career with the Mets, and your whole career with the Mets. I'm sure you have stories for days. Did you just compile all those stories and said, "Let me put a pen to a paper"? No, I had a few stories, but the, you know what it was? It was the last couple of years I was thinking about it. Ralph Kiner had passed on. And I was the only one left in 1962 that to participated in all those seasons. And I had something to say. So I figured, let me do it. Uh, I'm getting up there in years. And I figured it was a good time to reach out to the people, let them know some of the stories, let them have some fun with it. And if I go around with it, that uh, we can have a good time. Give us one story or one of your favorite stories from the book, from that 60, you know, 69 Mets team. Well, you know, I played for a lot of managers and, and probably the most famous one who happened to be uh, Casey Stengel. And he had a story where he, he wanted to be the only uh, acting clown on the ball club and uh, really it would interfere. He would talk to the press and stay with them all night and work with them and take the pressure off the players. But we had a, a guy that joined the ball club late in his career, Jimmy Pearsall. And he wanted to be a comedian and he wanted to compete with Casey and he had a home run and he started to run the bases backwards. He, so he went around the whole field backwards. And by the time he got to home plate, Casey was up on the step screaming at him and everyone was looking at Casey because, you know, I know he was at liking to have a good time, but uh, he didn't like Jimmy Pierce running backwards. And by the time he got to the dugout, he just called, told him to go sit down. And by the next day, he was out of the organization. So he was the only guy that could be a clown and really entertain the press. You know, what's funny about that, Ed. Every time I see my uncle, he tells me the story of Jimmy Pearsall running the base back. I'm like, Uncle Jimmy, you've told me this story 15 times. I know Jimmy Pearsall, you know, uh, ran the bases backwards after a home run. So it's funny you say that story because I've heard it a million times from him. My dad has told me that story. Um, I was enamored by that 69 Mets team. I met 20 of you guys, signed a big uh, picture. You guys used to do the sports card memorabilia shows out, I believe, in Westchester or White Plains. And I would go to meet you. You signed also 69 Mets yearbook. So that team was always fascinating to me because you guys came out of nowhere from all the misery from 62 to 68 to win your first championship. And now here we are waiting since 86 for a Mets championship with this team, Ed. Uh, what do you think of this bunch here? Because they have entered tank mode, as we call it, these last two months. They're playing a lot of 4A players, a lot of guys that no one's ever heard of. 
Is it frustrating to you watching these last two months of the Mets, or are you on the boat of, all right, I'm going to be patient and hope the prospects pan out and trust Uncle Stevie to bring in some big free agents this offseason? Well, I, I trust Uncle Stevie to go out and get some players, but I don't understand what they just did the last three weeks, just dumping their players. they still only six games behind. You know, the other clubs who in 1969 and 1973, we were a lot further back. And we came on and won a pennant. So I think he gave up a little soon. Uh, you know, and the fans here are tough to deal with. They're going to let them know what, just exactly what's going on. They don't appreciate playing AAA players and not producing. And uh, it's going to be a long half. The second half is very difficult when you lose so many games and you're playing, you know, in the National League. The fans are going to let them know it. That maybe that's why he hasn't been there for the last couple of nights. And is there a carryover with the losing, like to a next season? Like you think about these last two months and how many times they're going to lose. They just won a series, but we expect this to be a team probably ten games under five hundred. You know, isn't there a mindset there that you know going into spring training next year? Hey, we were terrible last year. Like, what's going to make us turn this around? Maybe they'll sign some great starting pitchers. I know it's a deep class, but. Is there kind of a carryover effect and and the mentality of losing? Well, there's a carryover, no question about it. They were expected to win this year. They thought they had the best club in baseball that money could buy, but it doesn't work out like that. You've got to put players on the field that can work together and, uh, you know, perform together. And uh, they struggled. But uh, just to dump them, I really don't understand that uh, mentality. But uh, I like to win, and I'm going out to win all the time. So, I just hope that uh, they win some ball games in a row and they start putting putting it together on the field and we can see a competitive team by the end of the season. You made an interesting comment a few weeks ago, and I would agree with you that this team doesn't have a true leader. There's no true leadership uh, on this roster. Um, do you think a team needs kind of that, that vocal leader and that captain? There is no captain on this team. People have said maybe Alonzo, but I don't know about that. Um, Lindor, Nimmo, but do you think a team needs a captain and needs that vocal voice to be, you know, a championship contender? Well, you need some players out on the field uh, that lead uh, the rest of the team and show us that they can do it every day and they they uh, are out to win. And, uh, you know, the rest of the guys will follow them, no question about it. But right now they have a very placid ball club, very low key, and they just go out and, try to play the game themselves, but uh, there's no excitement out there right now. So they do need a little pep. They need something. Maybe it's from the front office. Maybe it's from the management, but uh, they've been very quiet all year. Nothing seems to bother them winning or losing. They just go through the motions and that's not the right thing to do. Yeah. Ed, it seems like a lot of these guys, I don't know if they like each other. Like they're, I don't know if, like you said, they're not playing for each other. There's a lot of, you know, there's egos around, a couple of those egos are gone now. Um, but, you know, Alonzo has a bit of an ego. These guys don't seem to, like, rejoice together. There's no, like, that that moment in the clubhouse where there's, like, you know, a toy or, like, I always joke about TJ Rivera and the rally dildo on the Mets team. And, like, that fun little element, like, a guy hits a homer, you put a crown on him. There's a couple high fives, but that's it. And the guys just, you know, get on with their day. 69... Well- you, you guys loved each other, right? Like there's something to loving each other and that translates onto the field. Well, we still participate and do things together. There's there's still a number of guys still around from 69 and we still socialize together. We had a very close knit organization, 73. We had guys that led the ball club, like Tug McGraw, what is you got to believe and screaming and yelling in the dugout and the, uh, you know, he showed it on the field when he got out there. He was hyper and he was doing things that were in a positive vein. This ball club is so relaxed. I guess last year's way they played and, and finished, you know, they thought they had things going for them. But, uh, you know, they're two leaders this year. They're pitchers who are Hall of Famers and great players. They got off to a slow start because they got hurt. So they weren't in the clubhouse in the early part of the year and they didn't get out of the gate and they didn't get a lead. So they've been struggling from day one. Now they get traded. Now they have nobody there. They got to fill in with other players. They don't have the minor league uh, players to bring up that can fill in and, and produce on the field. They've got to learn how to play. And they only have about seven weeks, six weeks to go 
to really learn how to play. So you're out of it now, and you've got to start playing like you're a championship ball club. Yeah, and, you know, they're eight out, which isn't like crazy considering all the losing they've done this month and all the losing those wild card teams ahead of them did, Ed. I mean, if they were to keep some of these guys together, they could be three or four out right now and still very much in the race, right? Well, that's what I thought when the two pitchers came back. They were ready to pitch, so they might have had a streak. If they won seven or eight games in a row, they could have been right in it right now. But, you know, all of a sudden the ball club starts making trades. They made quite a few of them. And, uh, you know, they got out of contention in a hurry right now. They're just put going through the motions and, uh, you know, putting out a lineup. But they don't really have a ball club out there that's a set club. They He's feeling every player out trying to produce with somebody. And it's a tough position for uh, Buck to be into. And I, I wouldn't want to be the manager of this ball club. Do you think Buck says, hey, if, you know, Billy Epler made those comments about next year, we'll be competitive, but we're not going to have the same projections, which is a message that me and me and my co-host Figgy hate. We hate talking about projections for next year. Like, why would you not pun on next year, but say, hey, we're not going to be that good next year, but we'll be competitive. I thought that was a piss poor message to send this early and to send to the upcoming free agents. What guy's going to want to come here if you're telling us, oh, the you know, the weather projections tell us we're not going to be a 95 win team next year, but we'll try and be good so we could get some fans in the building. I didn't like that, Ed. I don't like it either. I like to win. We, I, I had too many years of losing in a row because we didn't have the talent. They still have five or six good players on the ball club that they can put out there every day. Now you add two or three and you've got a team again. So I didn't like the comments. I like to know that I'm going to win. And if I'm a free agent, I'm thinking about winning from, from day one, not at the end of the season. You start out with a positive attitude. So they've got some things they've got to change in that organization right now, I think, in order to improve themselves. And uh, a lot of it starts in the front office. He's the one making the deals. And I don't mean uh, Mr. Cohen. I think it's the general manager that's doing all this. He's the one that's making the deals. And he should be the one projecting a ball club to win. And especially for your fans, you've you've thrown them under the bus. You sold tickets this year on a winning team, a team to be competitive, and then you give up with seven weeks to go. You could be right in the race now because there's no good ball clubs other than Atlanta, and they'll go through their slump, and you could be right there. But right now, you know, everything is a, a challenge right now for the ball club, and uh, I'll go to a couple of games, but I wouldn't be consistently out there. Yeah. I mean, I go for the promotions. You know, I, I went for yesterday for these, this Edwin Diaz trumpet bobblehead here. I had to get one of these, but outside of that, it's hard to invest money to go to the ballpark to see, you know, Rafael Ortega hitting seventh and a bunch of four, a players. I've been on the side of, I think they got to move on from Billy Epler. He's got a four year deal. He's two years in any thoughts. Do you think they should move on? You know, John, they're talking about David Stearns coming in and kind of running the ship as team president. Do you think they should move on from Epler? You know what? He's had two years, and I'll tell you what, the ball club went from a a contending ball club in the playoffs to a club that's going to finish fourth or fifth. They could be anything. That's that's the wrong direction. You're going in the wrong way. So I hope he improves himself. But right now, you know, the records speak for themselves, and they're not very good. What do you think about Buck's future? He's got one year left. I'm kind of on the fence. I think if they're going to be younger next year, maybe you go in a different direction at manager. If you're not going to be a championship team, mm -hmm. I don't think Bucks final year should be managing a bunch of, you know, prospects and, and 23 year olds. Uh, do you think they should go in a different direction there? Well, I like Buck as a manager and he knows the game and he's been in very competitive over his whole career. This is unusual for him and he's not handling it very well either. So I don't know what's going on, but I think he deserves to come back. You know, based upon the ball club, he didn't mix it up. He doesn't make the trades. He gets players and he's got to produce for them. Right now, they're not producing. They're not playing well. But I think Buck's a good manager. He's the manager for the job when you have a competitive team. And they should be competitive. Right now, this is not a competitive ball club. Have you noticed a drastic difference from Wilpon to Cohen's? You know, you were you were there and the Wilpons were there. Um, and you know, you're obviously part of the organization and you've seen a difference. Have you seen that drastic difference in, in ownership and how they've invested in things and around the ballpark and treating, uh, you know, former players, any different at all? 
Well, Mr. Cohn said he was going to spend his money, and he certainly did. He had the highest payroll. So he went out and put his money out there, and they just didn't perform. But uh, certainly, let's let's dump the ship right now and try to get some younger players and fill up a farm system. But you got to go out and tell your scouts to sign those players and, you know, get your best players, you know, from your own material, you know, just by picking up players from another team that they're going to give you for your star players, I don't think is the answer, but he's got to go out and get somebody. Was there a speech from someone or a true leader who would rally the troops in 69 that had you guys turn the season around the last couple of months? Like, do, do you recall that one that one moment, that speech that got the got the guys going? Well, the only rallying call we had in 69 was the manager, Gil Hodges, who was a very strict disciplinarian. He had one set of rules for each of the players. You know, we had 25 players on the team. We didn't have that expanded roster like they have now where they bring guys up and down. And he controlled the ship every day. He controlled the ball club. And he put the guys out there. They had to be ready to play. I know defensively we were a good ball club. This club today is not a good ball club. They make a lot of defensive errors and mental errors, and that's something that you're not going to win with. You're not going to win a pennant making uh, you know those kind of mistakes. You've got to play good defense, have some hitting. You'll score some runs. Your pitching keeps the guys, the other team, from scoring. You should score enough runs, and you know they have to play right, but they're not playing right, and so it's going to be a tough uh, ending for this season. Do you ever think of, you know, you were, you know, rumored to be part of a potential trade for Joe Torrey. Do you ever think how your career might have changed if you were traded from the Mets and you weren't a lifelong Met and you weren't part of the 69 team? Does that change everything for you as, you know, as a, as a New York guy? Well, I don't know. I never thought about it being traded. I was always here in New York, but if I would have got traded to Milwaukee or some other club like that, they won an awful lot of pennants in the stretch. So, would have been nice to be part of that. Uh, we won one. We should have won two. Uh, that was a managerial mistake that of course it's the second World Series. But if Gill was around, we would have won a couple more pennants. Are you amazed that this team has only won once since that 69 mm-hmm. team? Like, I'm amazed. Like, you just think New York, the Mecca, like, there's been a few chances, but they haven't got it done. Is it amazing well, to you? Well, the club in the 80s was a pretty good ball club. Uh, the Mets rebuilt after we left, but uh, they had a good ball club, you know, in 86, 85, 86. Those years were very competitive. They were in it every year, and all of a sudden they fell apart. So who knows what happened off the field down there. I think they had some problems with certain guys after a while, but uh, they had a good ball club, had good pitching, and that was the big key to, to winning, and they should have won some more pads. Do you miss Shea at all, or do you, do you like City Field? Another so the food is I like incredible. City Field. I think City Field is a beautiful ballpark, and uh, would have been nice to hit in, in the City Field down the lines, pretty short, you know. And and it's a good ball club, and the fans love it. So I like going, and uh, I enjoy the game, and uh, I follow it, and I'm rooting for the Mets. But uh, right now, I might have to give up myself. <laughs> yeah the last few months it's, it's a tough watch it's tough doing this podcast twice a week i want to poke my eyes out some weeks it, it's been difficult and uh at least i'm getting outside getting some color got a little tan how are you and how is your health doing Ed? my health is doing well i mean my kidneys are working good uh we brought out this book now we're trying to have some fun with it ralph's not around but i'm around to answer any questions i hope the people buy it hope they enjoy themselves when they read it I think they will. There's enough stories in there to talk about it. And anytime I go around, I'm always talking about the book. The book is with Triumph Books. It's the last miracle of my 18-year journey with the amazing New York Mets. Ed Cranepool uh, with Gary Kaschak as well. Um, go get the book wherever you get your books. And uh, I'll close it with this. When will we see another one, Ned? When, when will the Mets win a goddamn World Series once again? So I could be on a float down the Canyon of Heroes. I'm 32 years old, and I've seen zero in my lifetime. Give me a prediction. Well, I, I hope shortly. I tell you what, I don't really know, but um, I think it'll be sooner than later. Let's All leave right. it like that. We'll take that. Well, hopefully the projections make it next year and or the year after, and we could get close to that three to five year window that Steve Cohen regrets saying in his initial press conference of when the Mets would win a championship. Lifelong. Well, I Mets. thought he was going to be right. So yeah. we'll see. Good luck.
Yeah, hopefully next year. Lifelong Matt, Ed Cranepool. Thank you for coming on Amazing But True. Great to catch up with you. Thank you. That'll say goodnight to episode 172 of Amazing But True, our New York Mets podcast from the New York Post. Thanks to Andrew Hartz for producing the show with me. And thanks to Ed Cranepool. Great stuff there. And Ed, Ed's honest. You know, he, he tells it how it is about this team. And you got to respect this guy's opinion because to play here 18 years and nowhere else, uh, that doesn't happen much in any sport for any team. No one really stays with one team anymore. So I respect the hell out of Ed for that. And I respect what he did for this Mets team. And, you know, he, a lot of it, he had a lot of numbers because he might have accumulated because he was here a long time, but he had a nice career. He got here when he was 17 at the start of a new franchise. So shout out to Ed Crane, Cranepool. Go out and get his book, The Last Miracle, wherever you get books. And a good interview there. Subscribe to Amazing But True on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, Amazon, wherever you get podcasts. On Apple, go in there now if you're listening. Give us a five-star rating. Write in a positive review. That helps us in the rankings. We appreciate that. And if you're watching the New York Post Post Sports YouTube page, give us a thumbs up. Let us know what you thought of the interview, what you think of Ed Cranepool, and what do you think of the Mets. Can they go on a miracle run? I'm not even going to ask that question because it sounds ridiculous. But it is fascinating to look at this wild card race and see no one breaking out. And the team leading it is the one who has David Robertson, who's played a big part. For them winning games. So you do wonder, what if you kept, you know, a Verlander, maybe you trade Scherzer, kept Verlander, maybe you kept a fam and you start fam. What could have been? But they did what they did. And now we see what happens come off season. Thanks, everybody, for listening to Amazing But True. Nelson Figaro will be back on Monday after the Mets' four-game series against the Cardinals. They'll see Steven Matz in St. Louis. So enjoy the four games. If you don't watch, I don't blame you. But enjoy the games. And the Mets won two out of three. They won a series. So we'll close it like we usually do with Let's Go Mets. Enjoy your weekend.